Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, professors and students. Uh, it's very happy that to have uh, Professor David Sorovis to give the second lecture tutorial uh, on the grand boundary structure and the dynamics. So in the first lecture, uh, Professor Sorovis introduced us some fundamental concept about grand boundaries, uh, some basic terminology such as low grand boundary, uh, high angle grand boundaries, and uh, today, he is going to continue uh, talk about the grand boundary energy, uh, metastability, and the uh, defects. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass the stage to Professor Solowicz. OK, thank you. OK, so. I'm going to pick up where we left off last time. Last time I introduced a bunch of concepts as we just talked about. And what I'm going to try to do today is talk more about how in a more modern view of grain boundaries, how do we think about energy, how do we relate it to structural units, how do we relate these things to um, crystallography, how do we think about metastability, and how does metastability affect certain properties of a grain boundary? And so I'm going to talk about that. And the next time, we'll start talking about grain boundary dynamics. OK? So that's what we're doing today. So as I said before, so we're talking about crystallography. That is, we need to agree on a language. <laughs> and crystallography is the language we'll use. Just some very basic concepts. OK, then I'll talk about different phases in grain boundaries. Um, we all are familiar with concepts of polymorphism, which is multiple, multiple possible crystal structures of different types of materials. You'll find out, and as we go on, that polymorphism is one of the fundamental features of grain boundaries. And it has a very strong impact on a lot of properties. OK, then I'll talk a little bit about grain boundary thermodynamics and talk about how, the, how those multiple phases affect grain boundary thermodynamics. And then we'll talk a little bit about configurational entropy and specifically, specifically glass-like behavior of grain boundaries. That is not to say a grain boundary is a glass, because it certainly is not. But some of the properties are reminiscent of glasses. And this was actually a question that was raised last time. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on it, since there was a question last time. And then what we'll talk about is I'll start talking about defects and grain boundaries and how to think about them. And this is going to be important for the next lecture, where we start talking about the dynamics of grain boundaries. And I mentioned here specifically the defects and grain boundaries we'll be talking about are line defects. And I write, wrote here the zoology. The reason I write zoology here is because there are a wide range of possible kinds of defects in grain boundaries. And the zoology really is just a statement is, we're going to catalog, like we do for animals, we're going to catalog different animals in the grain boundaries. And those are the line defects. OK, so that's the plan for the day. OK, specifically, what we're going to do um, first is talk about the bicrystallography. Normally, when you think about crystallography, we're talking about the symmetry of crystals. Here, we're talking about a grain boundary. So by definition, there are two crystals. And so we're not talking about the crystallography of one or the other. We're talking about the bicrystallography, which is the properties having to do with the pair of crystals. Okay, So that's what we call bicrystallography instead of crystallography. And as I will show you is that the bicrystallography depends both on what kind of crystals we have, but more importantly for the discussion today on the relative orientation of the two, or the misorientation between the two uh, crystals. Okay, So it's really misorientation that we're focusing on. And later on, I'll show you how do we think about grain boundary inclination. As you recall, inclination corresponds to two of the five macroscopic degrees of freedom. Okay, 
that is not directly part of my crystallography. And I'm going to also try to do it in a way where I emphasize the concepts and the ideas rather than the formal crystallography. Formal crystallography is very powerful, but unless you spend a lot of time on it, it's not necessarily so transparent. So I'm going to draw a lot of pictures for you instead of doing a lot of equations. And I'll also mention that this is a field which actually goes back to the 1960s, 1970s, where Bowman wrote a nice book on O-lattice theory, um, which is sort of was the basis for a lot of cases where we look at the intersections between two kinds of crystals. And this has to do with grain boundaries or between different kinds of crystals, heterophase interfaces. So I'll introduce the concept of a coincident site lattice and the DSC lattice. If you don't know what a DSC lattice is, I will go through it. I'm not even going to mention the name of it right now because it tells you nothing. And then I'll also mention that if you look back in the early days of this field, you can see a number of the people whose names are associated with this. Bob Pond, Bowman, who did the O lattice theory, uh, Bob Balufi, John Hurth, David Smith, Alex King, Adrian Sutton. There are a bunch of other people. I have to say that I'm old enough to know all of them except Bowman. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, so let's go on. So a grain boundary. Now, let me first say a few things about these two crystals. So I plot, these are two of the same kind of crystals. The one above the boundary plane I plot in black. The one I, below it we plot with white atoms. So, we, so this is sort of a two color version. Now, before I actually talk about the grain boundary, let me also note that these are, I put here, I put atoms in quotes because these are actually lattice sites. So for example, if there's a basis to it, those go on top of this, okay? So these are lattice sites, not really, really atoms, okay? These gray atoms here, which I circled in red, those are the coincident sites. That is to say, those are the sites that where you have an overlap between black atoms and white atoms, okay? That's why we put them in, in in gray, so combination of black and white. And this is, happens to be a symmetric tilt grain boundary and a simple cubic lattice, just so I would try to make the pictures as simple as possible. Okay, and this is the grain boundary plane, and you can tell it's symmetric because this is a mirror right here. Okay? So, now we're going to play a game. Here's the game. I'm going to go back here and play the game of I'm going to take this black lattice and extend it down all the way through all of space here. And I'm going to take the white lattice and extend it up through all of space there. I'm going to overlap it. So that's what happens when you overlap it. You end up with that. And some sites are in coincidence. So here's the gray sites. That's where the atoms overlap. But not all the black atoms overlap all of the white atoms. So just to keep you oriented, I'll just go back and forth for a minute just so you can see what happens when you extend one lattice down. Okay? So this is called a bichromatic pattern. Bichromatic, two colors, black and white. And the grays are just black and white. Okay? So that's the bichromatic pattern. Now, if you notice, the la atoms that overlap or are coincident form a lattice of their own. And that's shown here. And this lattice is not the lattice of the black atoms. It's not the lattice of the white atoms. It's the lattice that corresponds to that misorientation. And this is called the coincident site lattice because it's the lattice connecting all the sites which are coincident. Hence the name, okay? So a couple of things about this. First, it has nothing to do with the grain boundary. It has to do with the misorientation between the two crystals, and that's all. You can't even see a grain boundary there, right? 
We, so the other thing you'll notice is not all the atoms are in coincidence. So if one out of five of the black atoms is coincident with one out of five of the white atoms, so you can see I have one, two, three, four black atoms here, and then in these corners there would be one black atom each. Each corner is shared by four unit cells. So there's five atoms total. One out of five is coincident. So we say that this coincidence site unit cell has one-fifth of the atom's coincidence, or we would call that a sigma-5. So it's the reciprocal of the fraction of the, of the, of the, the, fraction of the atoms that are in coincidence. OK? So this is the CSL lattice. OK? Now I'll play another game with you. Let me take that lattice and shift all of the black atoms, the entire black lattice, to the left by an amount that will bring this black atom into coincident with that white atom. But I'm going to shift all of them by the same amount. So you'll see these, this case here where you had a black atom coincident with a white atom. If I shift the whole black lattice to the right, I'm sorry, to, yes, you're right. <laughs> sorry. Um, if I shift everything to the right by that amount, these will no longer be coincident, but this will be coincident. And since it's periodic, this one will be, this one will be, this one, this one, this one, etc. So that's going to be, so the, the green arrow is the displacement vector of the whole lattice. It is every one of those black atoms. OK, so now when I shift it over, you'll notice a couple of things. Again, I have exactly the same lattice. I've just moved the origin. OK? So shifting this over by this tiny, tiny bit here, that distance, that was enough to shift the origin of the coincident site lattice from here to there, actually a very big distance. OK? So here, you can watch. I hope you like my movie. Um, OK? So this shift is called complete in the sense that it leaves the coincidence site lattice unchanged. It just shifts the origin. But it's exactly the same lattice. Okay? Same symmetry, same periodicity, same translation vectors. It just shifts the origin. Okay? Now, if I go back to this CSL that I had before, the original one, you can see what I did to shift the CSL lattice. I moved, I shifted the whole black lattice in according to that translation vector right there. Okay? Now, I could have shifted the whole black lattice up to this place so this atom's coincident with that one, or I could have shifted the whole lattice down such that this is coincident with that, or I could have shifted it up so it's coincident. So it's coincident there. Um, OK? So there are many ways I could shift it. And each of these shifts moves the origin to a different place. So now if I look at all possible places there are to put that origin corresponding to all possible shifts, I end up with that gray lattice there. And that gray lattice is called the DSC lattice, which stands for Displacement um, Shift Complete, which is a terrible name. <laughs> so we like to refer to it instead as displacements which are symmetry conserving, which is a much better terminology, but not the original one. OK, so this black lattice is called the DSC, I'm sorry, the one shown in gray here is called the DSC lattice. And again, what the DSC lattice is, is it's all possible translation vectors that preserve the coincidence site lattice symmetry. OK? And there are many such shifts, and a whole lattice of shifts. It turns out, so I have two lattices here.
a coarse one, which is the CSL lattice with a big area, and a DSC lattice that has a very small, lattice, a small uh, unit cell. Looks like that. Okay? So those are the two lattices, and they're both important for the discussion we're going to be having. Okay? So, clear? Okay, good. Thank you. Now, if I take that and I throw out all the black atoms below here and all the white atoms above here, so if I draw a line, throw all the black atoms down here and the white atoms above it, I end up with exactly the same grain boundary we started with. Okay? So, oops. Ah, sorry. So the point I'd like to make is if I choose this line to be the grain boundary, throwing out the black atoms below, throwing out the white atoms above, bring me back to the structure. But I could have drawn a line here and thrown out all the black atoms below here and all the white atoms above here. The difference between those two, it's exact, they're two different grain boundaries, exactly the same misorientation, but two different grain boundary inclinations. Okay? So once I have the CSL, the DSC, I can construct all possible inclinations of a grain boundary. Okay? So that is to say that the uh, DSC and the CSL describe the misorientation, but not the inclination. Okay? So, let's start talking about other kinds of structures that you can get on grain boundaries. And this is a very old picture. Actually, it's one of the oldest ones I could find. It's an electron micrograph from a thin film. Here's a grain boundary here. This is from Bob Pond. It goes way back in the old days of microscopy. So there's the grain boundary here. That's the upper grain. In fact, that's where the top surface of the thin film is. That's the lower surface of the thin film. You'll see the grain boundary here. But one thing you note is that if you follow these lines across, you can see when you cross this line here, the grain boundary structure has shifted up by some amount. And in fact, it's exactly the same structure as here. It's just that I translate everything up by some translation vector. This line, therefore, is some form of dislocation because on one side the lattice is shifted one way, on the other side is shifted the other way. So I cross the line, I go through a shift. And the fact that this line, when it shifted up, didn't line up with this one or this one with that one, tells you that it's not a full dislocation, but a partial dislocation, because you, have a fault, you would have a fault associated with that. OK? So you go across the partial dislocation, and the structure just shifts. It may or may not be a different structure, and I'll, I'll tell you how to think about that later on. OK? So that's the point here. So you have certain kinds of shifts which um, are associated with dislocations in the boundary. Here's another one. This is now a boundary. So if this is the boundary plane here. This is looking along the boundary plane. So this is the grain boundary here. And the thing I want to note here is this is a shift of the two parts of the grain boundary this way. This one corresponds to the two parts of the grain boundary shifted this way. OK? So these are both kinds of shifts. This shift creates a step. And this we'll talk about later on is this is a DSC dislocation. DSC dislocation means it's a dislocation that has a translation vector which is one of the vectors of the, DS, of the DSC lattice that we talked about before. And that can be very small. OK? So these are two kinds of shifts, one in plane, the other out of plane. OK? And two different kinds of dislocations that will describe that. And we'll talk about that later on. OK? This is an old picture, and I apologize that
the reproduction is not very good. The only thing I want to show here is that this is a grain boundary in molybdenum. Boundary plane coming out here. And if you look at this grain, and the misorientation between these two grains is exactly the same as here. And the inclination of the grain boundary here and here are the same. The difference, though, is that the structures of the grain boundary, the atomic arrangements, are different here and here. And I'll show you some more examples as we go on. Okay? So this is one that's not associated with a dislocation per se. It's actually just a different atomic structure of the same boundary. Okay? And there's a more recent version, 2011. So this is a grain boundary in nickel. Again, I apologize for the reproduction. And if you look along this grain boundary, and you zoom in in different regions here and here, you can see the actual structure of the boundary in this part of the boundary and in that part of the boundary are different. Which is to say this grain boundary has at least two possible phases. And somewhere in between here and there, there must be a phase boundary. And the phase boundary, so if the two different phases are in the grain boundary, grain boundary is a plane, that phase boundary or domain boundary must be a domain wall in two dimensions. So a domain wall, if the, wall, if the domains are two dimensional, the wall between them is a one dimensional defect. And so I have some sort of defect that characterizes this domain wall in two dimensions. So the domain wall itself is one dimensional, okay? I.e. a line defect. And I, I'll show you some more examples in a little bit, but also 25 years ago, looking in an FCC material, I don't remember which one, um, Seidman and one of his students found 21 different structures of a 110 tilt boundary. Okay? So it could be that you have many different structures. Question? Yeah. Rather than the complexions, can I say that the left picture actually has one more layer of atoms? Right? Well, you, you, would say, you would say that the grain boundary is thicker here yes, like than there. Yes, like the somehow type of have extra half. Well, no, it, it's, it's, it just says the structure of the boundary is wider here than it is there. Whether they're extra atoms or not extra atoms, uh, it's not so easy. To, how do you count atoms in the boundary plane? Because remember, if you just add a plane of atoms between a grain boundary, between two grains, you just shift it up, and the grain boundary would just have moved. And you don't have to change the structure when you had a whole, you can add a whole plane of atoms, but you won't change the structure of the boundary necessarily. So this is a three layer thick grain boundary. You know, the structure itself is like three layers thick. So it's just different kinds of structures. Okay. It turns out that's an important point, though. I will come back to that also. Now, if I look at properties, so this is looking, um, at, a, looking at the diffusivity along a grain boundary in copper and looking at silver or gold diffusion along the grain boundary in copper. And it turns out at a particular temperature, you start getting a change in slope or a change in activation energy um, for diffusion. So this is log diff diffusivity versus 1 over T. So Arrhenius, and you see that there is a temperature at which you see a change. And the authors of this paper um, associated that with a grain boundary structural phase transition. Okay. And here's another example. And again, this is um, uh, this is Shen Dillon's work. Um, so what he's doing is looking at a polycrystalline material. And what he finds is if he looks at grain growth in alumina, undoped at pretty high temperature, he sees a certain amount of grain growth. But if you add a little bit of silica to the alumina, 
you find some grain boundary mobilities go way up. And they went in and actually looked at the structure of the grain boundaries, the ones that grew fast and the ones that did not, and showed that there's different, that there's different um, grain boundary structures there, okay? And induced by the addition of silica. Okay, it doesn't apply to all grain boundaries. By the way, people, uh, they're, they're, there's a community who uses the term complexion to just describe grain boundary phases. That's a question of taste. Okay. And I'll show you one more example and then we'll get back into it. This is an atomistic simulation of a grain boundary in iron. And it's a low angle grain boundary. And you can see that along this grain boundary there's an array of dislocations. There's an extra plane of, of atoms here. It's hard to stand close and do this. But it's a low angle grain boundary. And you remember the misorientation between the, the misorientation angle between two grains when the misorientation angle is small is just, the misorientation angle is just pro proportional to the Burgers vector divided by the spacing, B over D. Okay? Now, it turns out that you can also make a stable grain boundary of exactly the same misorientation where the Burgers vector is twice as large and the spacing is twice as large. And this is stable and this is stable. Okay? This one turns out to be higher energy than this one. But the point is, you can make two stable structures even of a low angle grain boundary. It's not just a property of high angle grain boundaries. Okay? So again, this is a relatively low angle grain boundary and it's just, they call this a dislocation pairing transition, phase transition. But, and the difference is the Burgers vector and the spacing between the dislocation changes, but the misorientation, that is the five macroscopic degrees of freedom, are exactly the same. Okay? So, here we go. Let's get back into this. So, as we spoke about last time, the grain boundary is described by five macroscopic degrees of freedom. So the misorientation I can talk about in terms of a rotation axis, and the rotation axis is two degrees of freedom, two angles, and the rotation angle about that axis is one more. So three degrees of freedom is associated with misorientation, and the grain boundary plane has a normal, and normal has two degrees of freedom because it's a unit normal. Okay, so five degrees of freedom. And I can do a pure twist, I can do a pure tilt, or if I rotate the boundary plane, I can get anything in between. Okay, we talked about that last time. However, five degrees of freedom do not the grain boundary structure define. Okay, so there are microscopic degrees of freedom. And so if I fix the five macro degrees of freedom, I can have microscopic degrees of freedom. So let me talk about two. So if, if I take two grains and I abut them like this, I'm specifying the misorientation and the boundary normal. But if I sh slide one grain relative to the other, it doesn't change the five macroscopic degrees of freedom. So we usually say, we don't usually worry about this because we say, well, nature will just pick the shift that it wants. And it does, okay? So you can have these microscopic degrees of freedom which, re which represent the t shift of the grain boundary, of the two grains relative to each other parallel to the grain boundary, this way or that way. So those are two microscopic degrees of freedom corresponding to in-plane transitions. The other thing I can do is I can change the number of atoms or the atom fraction of the grain boundary. So I can, pick, I can define a parameter here, phi, and say, well, I can talk about either it's full or empty. It's like a glass, half empty, a glass full or empty, depending on how you like to think about it. 
So here, there are no vacancies along the grain boundary. Here, I've just removed half the atoms. And so the vacancy concentration or the concentration of atoms that are present at the boundary are different in those two cases. So that's a non-conservative degree of freedom. Non-conservative because I either have to add or remove atoms. Okay. Now, if I remove, after I remove these atoms, if I remove these as well, then the two grains go, they just shift together, and I'm back to the original case. And you can't tell that I added a plane of atoms. It's the answer to your question. So adding a plane of atoms does nothing. Adding a fractional plane changes the microscopic degrees of freedom. OK? Question? This notion of some fraction of inbound is applied to elemental metals. Because it's, uh, if you have uh, two, more than two elements now, it comes to the power of the grain boundary. Yes. So we pick which atom can we move the grain boundary for a single elemental metal memory is OK. But for all components, it's going to be Right. So, so let, let's take an example. Imagine we had an ordered alloy like uh, sodium chloride or nickel-3 aluminum or anything like that. Okay. Now, you're right that it, you know, the, I, would first, I would have to have at least two degrees of freedom, one corresponding to nickel, one corresponding to aluminum. So I'd have to tell you the fraction of both. But I also have to tell you how they're arranged in the plane. And that's an extra degree of freedom that we don't have to worry about in elemental materials. And like I said at the beginning of the first lecture, I'm not going to be talking about composition this time, but it's a good question. So in the next series of lectures, we'll talk about that. I'm just kidding. Uh, so yes, question? Some people say uh, you have well, you know, the interesting thing about diffuse boundaries, if I'm talking about the five macroscopic degrees of freedom, it says absolutely nothing about the structure. So diffuse or not diffuse, it doesn't matter. For the microscopic degrees of freedom, it tells you how the atoms are arranged along the grain boundary. And, you know, some grain boundaries can be wide like I showed you in some of those complexion pictures a minute ago. Some are wider, some are narrower. But you know, diff diffuse is a diffuse term, right? It doesn't really mean very much. It just means it's not atomically sharp. And if it's not atomically sharp, all the crystallography still applies. It's just harder to actually visualize it. So uh, it's, it's an interesting question. At, at this point, I don't care whether it's sharp or diffuse. OK? When I actually look at the atomic structures, I do. OK, so let's go back here. I'm going to start with two grains, the upper grain and the lower grain. Here's the grain boundary plane. And now I can translate one grain relative to the other by some amount. And when I do that, if I translate one grain relative to the other by some amount here, and then I take my hands away and let it go, it may just shift right back to where it started because I made a bad displacement. So it turns out that if I go in and look at one unit cell, so this is the whole CSL, so all translations have to fit within the CSL. So that's the repeat distance. AC is the area of the unit cell, the CSL unit cell. Alpha C is the unit cell of the DSC lattice. And so everything can be reduced to this. And so if I take this and I blow it up, and I displace one crystal relative to the other by some fixed amount to here, and then I take my hands away from those two crystals, it could just wander downhill in energy until it finds where it wants to be. And if I happen to displace it to here, shift it by that amount, it will, def it will shift spontaneously to its closest minimum. And it just goes downhill till it finds the, lowest, the closest lowest minimum. So it turns out for a particular boundary, I may have one, two, three, four different minima. Each one has a different 
domain or basin of attraction. And these walls here, these are not great in boundaries. These walls are like, it's like the continental divide. You know, like you have a mountain range here, and it rains, the water will either go to the left or the right. So if I displace it to this point, it'll go here. If I displace it to that point, it'll go to that one. So these alphas here represent the area of this domain. And these represent the, the actual stable grain boundaries. And now, this one may be much lower energy than this one. So this one is metastable with respect to that. But metastability just means the system has multiple choices of which displacements it wants. And like I said, it could have many of them. Okay, and again, all we're doing here is we're looking at the magnitude of the dis we're putting, giving it a displacement, a, a degree of freedom, a microscopic degree of freedom, and then relax it and it goes to something. Okay, so this corresponds to all the states you can find by doing a translation. So we call that a T space. Okay, so those are all the translations. Okay. So if I do little shifts and I minimize the energy, I can make these shifts very small even compared to an interatomic spacing and find them. And so I can track out, I can identify, tabulate all possible metastable states and the size of the domain of attraction associated with it. Okay. And if I go back to that same CSL kind of picture I had before, this is the CSL, that's the area of it, and those are all the translations. So one out of five, in this case, is sigma phi boundary. That's the translations. And this corresponds to the DSC, you know, all the possible translation vectors. And the point is, the DSC lattice has a size alpha C. That's this area of the DSC unit cell. And so we'll be using that again, that alpha C. That's the size of the DSC unit cell. AC is the size of the CSL. Question? Can you go back to the first slide? So according to the, uh, the energy, the DSC, it's like energy. Yeah. Yes. Landscape. Yeah, that's what that's what these contours are trying to show the energy landscape. Yes. So because you're saying that the DSC, DSC lab is both in Canadians and the whole boundary. So I understand the right, if you simply suggest that okay, so the Canadian ring boundary actually or somehow determine mobility of okay, so the green boundary. The mobility? Because you easy to glide, you get to the uh, the uh, the state. Uh, possibly. It happens that the Right. So how easy it is to translate, actually to slide along a grain boundary, will depend on how high the saddle points are along here. Right? So yeah, so if I'm going to actually do an atomistic calculation and try to slide, then it does depend on that. But just like, you know, for most problems that we do, like when dislocations move, the energy required to move it to slide one crystal relative to the other. If you just try to slide it rigidly, which is what this does, that gives you a barrier, but that's the barrier that corresponds to the ideal strength. But if the way it really works is by moving dislocations, and there's another barrier associated with moving dislocations. So this would just be, this would be similar to like a gamma surface. For those who are used to thinking about dislocations, we call this a gamma surface. So this is like a gamma surface. Yeah. OK, so now let's spend a few minutes talking about symmetry. This is really cool. So, <laughs> so this is a particular grain boundary. This is the same one I've been showing you, the sigma 5100 tilt axis 0, 1, 2 slip plane. This is in BCC, so it's tungsten. So this would be the CSL, um, the uh, DSC. 
Well, actually, that would be the DSC. And what I want to do first is say, well, if I go through and find out where all the minima are, each black dot here corresponds to a minimum in the energy of the grain boundary. So that's a shift where the energy is a minimum. And we can find, we can find that. Okay? So the shading is the same shading I showed you before. But the thing that I want to point out is these minima are related to the symmetry of the boundary. So if I look at the unit cell for the bicrystal, and I look at the point group symmetry of the boundary, in fact, we're looking at the hollow symmetric group. The hollow symmetric, you know what a hollow symmetric group is? OK, <laughs> one person does. So the hollow symmetric group is, first, if I take whatever crystal structure I'm dealing with, you know, let's say I take an FCC material, or I look at, say, the Brave lattices. There are 14 Brave lattices. But if I delete all of the, um, the face centerings, the body centerings, all those things, it turns out there's only seven basic structures, not 14. Okay? So I just take the two-dimensional, we call this the layer group, and I then delete all those things, which are these higher order structures. That gives me the hollow symmetric group. And it turns out for this grain boundary, there's certain symmetries that are there. So these are two-fold axes. These are mirror planes here and here. The, um, so the red ones are mirror planes. And this green one is going to actually be the size of my DSC. Sorry, I changed notation on you. I apologize. But if I look at these two points, say point here R1 and point here R2, there's a mirror here. And if I look at the atomic structure of this one, it looks something like that. If I look at the atomic structure of this one, of this one, it looks something like that. Now clearly those two things are related. They're related by a mirror symmetry. And it turns out that this mirror symmetry here implies that if I have a region which corresponds to this minimum, R1, and I have another minimum corresponding to R2, which are, have this mirror symmetry, it turns out that those have to be separated by a partial dislocation. I'm not going to go through to prove it, but you, know, you can see that the symmetry and the type of defect between them are related. Just like you have translation symmetries to give you the what are the allowed Burgers vectors in a crystal, here we have these same sort of symmetry ideas. And so this point here, so the whole thing has, has group uh, P2MM. And there's, it's fourfold, so I have, a, um, I have a degeneracy of four here. If I go to that point, there's a mirror just one mirror, so it's a P1M1. So since it's a mirror, it only have uh, two symmetries, this one and the one across here. If you look at that mirror, this one and that one. So this is actually the irreducible unit cell. The translation between this one and this one correspond to that mirror, and that tells you it must be a partial dislocation. Now if I just you can't tell that just by looking at it, except if I draw in these lines. Say there's a mirror here, and you see this one and this one have to be mirror related. Now, what's the relationship, say, between this one and this one? Well, it turns out you can't tell by looking at the mirrors. But it turns out, and that's this case here, that if I look at this structure and this structure, they look like they're almost, they're very closely related. But really what's happened is to go from here to there, I have to shift the boundary by half of a unit cell and apply a mirror. So associated with a translation, I have to have another kind of defect. And that turns out to be related to the displacement shift complete DSC lattice. And that turns out to be a disconnection. 
But if I know the symmetry of the two phases, I know what defect must be in between them. There's no choice. This one corresponds to a translation of the boundary. And that's actually, as we'll see later on, that has, that's a symptom uh, characteristic of a, of a disconnection. OK. So I can do it for lots of boundaries. <laughs> I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but you know, this is in tungsten. This is a sigma 5 boundary, symmetric tilt boundary. This is another symmetric tilt boundary. The green line is the DSC lattice. The green line cell is the DSC lattice. The gray one is the irreducible unit cell. These red lines are mirrors, and the dashed lines are, are glide planes. Well, in, two, in this many dimensions, the glide lines. OK? And if I look at, say, silicon, I have more. If I look at this silicon, the sigma 5013, which is like, the, well, a different one, you can see there's a lot of them. If I look at a twist boundary, I can identify all of them. OK? So we know how to find the stable states for any macroscopic, five macroscopic degrees of freedom. OK, I'll show you one more, one more type of metastable states. And then we'll go in and we'll start actually looking at some of the statistics, because we learn a lot from the statistics. OK, so as I said, up to now, we're talking about the shifts, the microscopic degrees of freedom corresponding to the shifts this way and this way the translation states, OK? But now I can actually separate the two crystals. I have a degree of freedom that is normal to those two translations we talked about. And this is the one we access by adding atoms or removing atoms. So if I'm doing a radiation damage kind of problem, I add vacancies or interstitials to the grain boundary. They go into the grain boundary. They change the structure of that boundary. That corresponds to changing this variable we called phi before. And if I add a whole plane of atoms, or remove a whole plane of atoms, that corresponds uh, to annihilation of a whole plane worth of vacancies. Because we all know, we teach students all the time. And that means it may or may not be true, but we teach it. <laughs> If I put vacancies into a grain boundary, we say grain boundaries are sinks for vacancies or interstitials. But matter is not created or destroyed. So if I add the interstitials to the boundary, what does it mean that the, those interstitials are absorbed? Well, it's actually very simple. It's very simple because if I add a whole plane of atoms, that just a plane of atoms right here, that just means the two crystals have shifted apart by one atomic plane. And so the outside of the crystal where the free surface is, it actually displaces outward. So when I absorb vacancies or interstitials, I'm actually transporting matter to the outside, but I do it by a rigid shift, right? So if I take out a plane of atoms and put it on the surface, it's exactly the same thing as if I just put, as if I just take the atoms out and then I let it go kerchunk and just goes, shifts in. Okay? So I'm not creating or destroying matter. I'm just shifting it to the outside. How am I shifting it? It's just elasticity. Okay? So when we say vacancies or interstitials are absorbed or annihilated a grain boundary, it's a misnomer. What it does is adds a plane and removes a plane of atoms that's elastically transported to the surface. OK? So it's actually a very important point to even talk about sintering, by the way. Um, OK. Now, if we add some atoms to a boundary, and this is some work by uh, Tim Frolov. And if you look at this particular boundary and add some atoms, you can actually shift between two structures of the grain boundary. So here's one structure. Remember, I talked last time about a structural unit model. We talked about these structural units. These are two different kinds of structural units. They're both stable. That is, they both correspond to minima in the energy. And so for this boundary, there are two possible structures. 
for this boundary, which is the same misorient, is the same, the same sigma five boundary, but two different boundary planes. And this one, it turns out, there's three stable structures. Okay, and Tim Frala, his colleagues, found this uh, some time ago. So the point is, these are two metastable states or three metastable states for different boundaries, just by adding or removing atoms. Okay. And if I change the fraction of atoms at the boundary, if I add enough atoms, I have one structure. So this is the grain boundary energy as a function of the fraction of the plane covered. And it turns out that you have a very small difference between these energies. And as I add more and more, I'll get a transition from one to the other. OK, so those are the two cases. So here you get three structures corresponding to this case or two structures corresponding to this boundary here. And interestingly, if I look at a grain boundary here, this is at 800 degrees Kelvin for the 310 boundary, it turns out you observe part of the boundary in one structure and part of the boundary in the other structure. So over here it looks like that, over here it looks like that, and in between you have a line defect, the line's coming out of the plane like this, and that separates the two domains. And you can look at it and it's obvious that there's a step associated with that. And not only is there a step associated with it, there's also a Berger's vector associated with it. So we'll come back and talk about that as disconnections. So here by adding removing atoms, we're also exploring different phases of a boundary. Okay. So, this is a 100 zero zero tilt axis in tungsten with body center and cubic. We're looking at symmetric tilt grain boundaries. And these are the, this is the curve of grain boundary energy versus misorientation. And you can see that it has this classic cusped structure. And those cusps exist at relatively low values of sigma. And that's what you get. That's the minimum energy structure. However, at most of these positions along here, there's not just one possible structure. There's many possible structures corresponding to different metastable states. So here's some examples of those structures. And I think roughly you would say there's about a gazillion of them. <laughs> That's a technical term, by the way. Yeah, just kidding. Um, so the point is, there are certain structures, certain misorientations, where you have a huge number of possible metastable states. So I shouldn't think about grain boundary energy versus misorientation as a curve. I should be thinking about it as a band of possible structures. Okay, so this is the minimum. And if I want to know about the finite temperature properties of the boundary, where I'm not only exploring the minima, I'm exploring some of the excited states, rest of these matter. And the higher the temperature, the more they matter. Okay, at very low temperature, you're going to be stuck around the bottom. As you go to higher temperature, the average will probably be somewhere above it. Okay. So that's important. So I can characterize this by counting the number of states at each five macroscopic degrees of freedom. I can talk about how wide this is, you know, how broad it is in energy. And I could try to describe the randomness of the boundary by talking about how many states are available. So I can talk about an entropy. And I'll mention that briefly in a little bit. Let me go back, though, and look at this curve for a minute and look at this structure here. It looks kind of random, right? But it's far from random. It's actually very systematic. So. As you all recall, last time we talked about the structural unit model. And for example, if we look between, say, 
this point here, zero degrees, where the structure is described like that. And here at 36.87 degrees, where the structure looks like that. Everything in between, I can describe by linear combinations of these two. Now, if I go along some other path through here, it could be just related to the fact that certain structures here, there's two metastable states or three metastable states. So if I, co if I look at the path between, say, this misorientation and that one, if I say, well, it could be a, a you know, state A or A prime or B or B prime or B double prime, you know, two or three metastable states, and then I can look at all the combinations of those two states in between, each one of those tracks a path through, through this what looks like a random set of points. And so if I just sort of zoom in on this relatively small region here, these different paths here just correspond to combinations of different structures. And the thing that I want to point out, and why the structural unit model, people said failed back in the 80s, was if I were trying to describe the minimum energy structures, well, the minimum energy structures correspond to combinations of different kinds of units, because these curves cross. So this may be a, a unit, but you know, one two, combination of two kinds of units. This could be between one of those units and something else. And so if I look at the structure all the way across there, it's a combination of many kinds of units corresponding to combination of different metastable states. So at different orientations, at one orientation the state may be stable and not the other one metastable. But if I cross um, I cross a, a point like this, then which one's stable and from metastable will change. Okay? So to really understand even the minimum energy path, I can't look at one or the other. I have to look at all the possible states and see which ones are the ones that combine. Okay, but the result is it gets really complicated because, as I showed you, I have a gazillion possible states. So this is way too complicated. So let's take a step back and start asking these questions more statistically than you know, quant predictively. Okay. So now we'll start talking about um, we'll start talking about some of the statistics. Okay. So I'm going to define a configurational entropy is in terms of this sort of normal Shannon entropy kind of description where P represents what's the probability that I'm in this state or that state or this state. So that's the PIs. And the simplest way to think about this is, well, if I just randomly give it a shift for five macroscopic degrees of freedom, I randomly give it a shift, that shift will take me to a particular point. And the bigger the basin of attraction, the higher the probability I'll end up in this one, say, compared to that one. Bigger basins of attraction means higher probability of occurrence. And so if I look at the translation state here, and I say PI is just the area of this basin of attraction compared to the DSC unit cell area. That's a probability. And so any given grain boundary, I can then calculate a Shannon-type entropy associated with that distribution of possible states. It doesn't mean which ones are going to happen. It just says these are the possibilities if I choose them at random. And as we all know in statistical mechanics, you almost never choose at random. You always do important sampling. And some, some will be, you know, deeper minimum will occur more often. It's not just the area. But if I go in and I look at things like the configurational entropy for a bunch of different grain boundaries, tilt boundaries in uh, an FCC material, in a diamond cubic material, in a BCC material, it turns out that there's, uh, it just goes very simply like the logarithm of um, the area of the, of the CSL lattice like this. 
in very systematic way. So it goes kind of like that. And the trend is it goes you know, something like sigma. Okay. So the point is you can, you can ask statistical questions about this by doing, getting enough data. But let's think about it a different way. Let's just say I take a very large simulation and I just let it run a long time until it equilibrates. So now we're not choosing the states randomly, we're equilibrating, right? So you run a long, long, long time and you equilibrate. And it turns out for this boundary, there are three different states which are colored in this funny way here. Okay, and so you get some domains of one state and domains of another state and domains of another state like that. And so I, I do get domains. So this is at 1,000 degrees Kelvin and tungsten. 1,000 degrees in tungsten is still cold. Okay. Um, and I can say, well, what about equilibrium? So if I want to do equilibrium, I could say the actual probability that I end up in a particular state depends on the relative area of that state, as we just talked about before. And then there is actual thermodynamics. I could say, well, what's the energy of that state? And so this is sort of like a Boltzmann weighted probability. So the high energy states, gamma will be big, so e to the minus gamma over kt is small. And so there's, three, there's a couple points. One is, I've got these three states, you know, A, B, C here, I could call it A, B, C. Some are high energy, some are low energy. And then I also have to worry about there's some interface in between, domain wall in between. And those are the line defects I mentioned before. So in general, I don't know what these things are, but morally, it should look like this, right? It's like just doing statistical mechanics on it. So that's what happens if you equilibrate. On the other hand, if you just pick them at random, and then the probability you end up in any particular state just depends on the size of the domain of attraction. And that's what we call, in simulation, we call that a cylinder quench. So you go to a very, very high temperature, you equilibrate, then cool it down, and you see, what state am I in? And then you do it again, and you do it again. This is how you get this probability distribution. That then depends on the area of each one. Okay, so let's go back now and say, well, Oops, sorry. What does it look like here? So let's look at silicon here. Silicon, so remember I was talking about cases where I have two or three metastable states. Silicon, I can have 10,000 states <laughs> for some of them. And if I look at the minimum energy configuration, that's the blue line. If I look at what I would get by looking at just this random quench, the Stillinger quench, I would get the red line. And if I try to equilibrate it, um, if I try to equilibrate some finite temperature, it turns out that you'll get, say, the green line will be slightly above the blue line. And so you get some sort of uh, thermal average. And so you'll always fall into this category where the minimum one is the lowest, the cylinder quench is the highest, and in between. That's the random one, that's the, the zero temperature equilibrated one, and that's the finite temperature equilibrated one, which will always be a little higher. Okay, so, grain boundaries have many, many possible states. Now if I think, what else do I know of that has many possible minimum energy states? Well, glasses are like that. You know, there's a huge number of, min of states. And so, if you go back and look in the grain boundary literature, going back a long time, some of the earliest models of grain boundaries basically said, I've got a crystal here, I've got a crystal there, and I've got an amorphous region in between. If you do microscopy on this, you find out that grain boundaries are not glassy. They're actually highly structured. Okay, they're complicated, right? So what I'm gonna propose for you is say, grain boundaries are highly structured, but the behavior, 
can be like a glass. It doesn't mean the structure is like a glass, but some of the behavior can be glass-like. And I'll try to prove that point to you in a minute. Okay, and whether you say a grain boundary is a glass or, or ordered depends on exactly what question you ask. A structural question, a property question. So the point is you have an extremely high density of metastable states. They're very close in energy, so it's easy to get trapped. And that means that if it's easy to get trapped, it's going to, the grain boundary properties will depend on how you prepare it. And that could have a very strong influence on properties. I'll give you some examples. OK, I'll go through a few examples, and then I'll quit. OK, grain boundary mobility. This is now looking at one particular grain boundary. It's not a symmetric grain boundary. It's not a sigma misorientation. It's just kind of a complicated grain boundary. And if you look at the mobility of the boundary versus, ta versus time, or the position of the boundary versus time when you're driving it, you find out as you go to higher and higher temperature, the slope goes up. So the grain boundary mobility is higher and higher and higher. That's not a surprise. <laughs> Now, if there was, if this is the classical picture, you would say the mobility of the boundary should go like an Arrhenius function, like a mobility times e to the minus q over kt. But that means that there's some well-defined barrier. On the other hand, if you have many, many, many barriers, then you're more likely to get something like a glass-like behavior, or a Vogel-Fulcher kind of behavior, and it should look like that. And so now, if you go back and try plotting the mobility versus temperature according to those two functions. This is the Arrhenius form, which would be a nice straight line. It's nice and straight. And this is the fit to the Vogel-Fulcher relation. And it just works much better. So in this case, it's a suggestion that some of the properties are glass-like. It is just a suggestion. OK? So, Consistent with a glass forming liquid. So, is there any accounts for the fragility of green boundaries? Um, there's been a few calculations recently where people try to use that. Um, there's a guy at a NIST who was doing the blanking on his name right now. It's embarrassing as a co author. <laughs> um, OK, let me go through some other cases that seem to suggest this is glass-like. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a grain boundary and equilibrate it at different temperatures, 2,000, 2,400, 3,000. And I'm going to look at the grain boundary energy as a function of time. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it for a certain amount of time, and then I'm going to quench it to zero temperature, measure the energy. And then I'm going to run it again for a while, and then I'm going to quench it again. And every time after the quench, I'm going to measure the energy. And so this is the energy at 2,000 degrees versus time. So this is giving me the statistics of the energy. And if I do it at 3,000, you can see it's a much larger fluctuation. And so if I go, if I go and plot, um, the, you know, if I look for this boundary at the number of possible states there are, the energies of those states, I would get a distribution like that. And if I then plug it in and calculate what the equilibrium concentration is, depending at which temperature, if I go to a higher and higher and higher temperature, then it gets more and more close to this one. And what that tells you is you're sampling more and more of the structures. As you go to lower temperatures, you're still, you're only sampling the bottom here. So if I go in and calculate the configurational entropy, of just the, you know, the, just the number of states, I get SC. If I do it with the Boltzmann weight like that, I can get a configurational entropy. And if I plot that configurational entropy versus temperature, I get a curve that looks like that, which if you just follow it down, will go to zero at a finite temperature. And having the configurational entropy go to zero at a finite temperature we always teach our students in thermodynamics classes this can't happen. It violates the third law of thermodynamics. 
And so the fact that it goes, the entropy goes to zero at a finite temperature, that's what a glass does. And people call this the Kaussmann temperature. They call this going to zero at a finite temperature. That's the Kaussmann paradox. And this is typical of glasses, OK? If I do a different grain boundary, I would end up with a different Kaussmann temperature. OK, oops, one last. Uh, two. One last example, an argument, and then I'll just wrap it up. Now, here's another case where I just take one grain boundary. I started all in configuration A. And I just start adding interstitials to it. And I end up with these multiple structures, you know, structure A, structure B, structure C. And as, I, as a function of time, I can, I can see that I can get different I can get um, dominance by different structures. So this is concentration. I'm sorry, this is the fraction, which is A. This is the, actually, I don't remember which one's which. This is the fraction, which is structure C. And that's the fraction, which is structure B. And first, you see it's a periodic function, probably because once you add enough atoms to it, you just get back to phi equals 0 or phi equals 1. And so it's nice and periodic, but you end up with a certain distribution. And again, this is a case by not changing temperature. This is by adding atoms. OK, one last example about glasses. And then I'll get back to the, line, to the domain wall energy. And then we'll call it quits for the today. OK, so if you have many metastable states, it's easy for the system to get stuck in the wrong one. And so it's like you have a bunch of different traps, energy traps. So there's this idea which just says that when you have a lot of traps, you can get stuck in different ones and you can explore less region of phase space. And so you go to lower and lower temperature, the region that you can explore is smaller and smaller and smaller because you can't activate out of those traps. And so the Adams-Gibbs theories said that if you have typical relaxation times for almost any kinetic phenomena, that relaxation time should go like e to the some constant over the configurational entropy times temperature. So the point is things should get slower and slower and slower like this. And so grain boundaries where you can have very large configurational entropies will give you relaxation time spectra that look like that. OK. So let me just end it with two slides about what happens between there. So again, this is the same picture. You've got three domains corresponding to A, B, and C in this particular grain boundary. So if I was going to go you know, simplify it. I might get a structure that looks like that. So I get domains of A, domains of B, domains of C, and in between them, there are domain walls, right? What are the domains? Well, I can have domains that are going to be related to the degree, microscopic degrees of freedom. So if I have two domains where the structures are related by a translational symmetry of the space, then they can be structurally identical. Or if it's related by a point group symmetry, so the points here is like two points like here and there, it could be symmetry related by the point group symmetry, but the structures now are not the same. And then another case where the structures cannot be the same at all is where you're sort of moving in this space. So this is translation space going that way or this way, and this is changing phi along that way. So if you go from here to a space there, then those, cannot, those are structurally inequivalent. Okay, So those are different kinds of domains. And the domain walls that I get just depend on how, what symmetries relate the different metastable states. So if it turns out that the metastable states are related by translational symmetry, they will be structurally identical. They will have uh, 
There will be DSC dislocations or disconnections. And it's also possible that it's, you get like a stacking fault, but that stacking fault corresponds to a zero energy stacking fault. And that's what happens when you have DSC dislocations. If it turns out that the, the domain wall is in between, the two things are related by a point group symmetry operation, then I have partial dislocation. I'm sorry, in the partial dislocation case, you have zero stacking fault. And then you could also have cases where you have partial dislocation with a finite stacking fault. And if you've got structurally inequivalent ones, for example, changing phi, moving in this direction, then you can have partial dislocations with stacking faults or combinations of stacking faults, anti-phase boundaries, and separated by disconnections or partial dislocations. So we'll talk more about that next time. And I'll just tell you that if you look at the symmetries between different metastable states, you know, whether it's something where it corresponds to a translational symmetry, a, a rotational, or something else in the point group, you have different kinds of line defects in between it. And this is actually a list of all possibilities of defects in grain boundaries. So if we know the symmetry, the symmetry relations between the states, then you know what line defects must be present. Okay? So I'm going to stop there. Just tell you next time we'll talk about the impact of these line defects on the dynamics of grain boundaries. Because as I'll show you next time, most of the dynamics of grain boundaries can be tracked to the motion of the defects between domains. Okay? Whether there are disconnections, partial dislocations, etc. Okay? So that's what we're going to do next time. And this is this this part here where we're looking at the relationships based on symmetry between different metastable states. That's sort of the basis of the modern theory of how we understand the statistics, the statistical mechanics of grain boundaries. So that's what we're going to do next time. And thank you for your attention. And we'll see you all in a week. Thank you uh, for the nice tutorial. Um, now let's go to the Q&A session. Uh, anyone have any question? Uh, David, you uh, showed the, uh, there are many grand boundary states for sigma phi. That's good. But did you try the most stable one, sigma 3? Did, yeah. Did, did you think they also have many uh, grain boundary state? Well, okay. So, yeah, good question. Not not every grain boundary has multiple states. The the tw the co if I start with a, a coherent twin in FCC, it usually only has one state. But I don't know if that's a general statement or not. But you know, I just showed it's you go general generally and I'm not saying this is always true. Mm -hmm. Generally, as I go to higher sigma, right. I will get more possible states. And it's actually easy to understand in terms of a structural unit model because if, if the low sigma boundaries only have a couple states, mm -hmm. and the ones in between are combinations, so if I have two states here and three states here, I could just take the combination of two and three to get that. And then I could say even where I distribute, I have different ways of arranging those those minority units. Yeah, so you get many. Uh, domain state must require the energy cups may not be that deep, like the sigma three. So energy cups is very very deep. So yeah. So sigma sigma three is, I mean, it's it's a grain boundary like every other grain boundary. But on the other hand, it's so special. That uh, if we talk about the statistical features of it, the statistical features are quite unique. And by the way, you know there aren't that many such. You know, FCC has nice twins, coherent twins. The energy is almost zero compared to the other ones. Most other structures don't have ones that are so low. That's the one I ask. Twin, twin is a sigma three, right? In FCC. In FCC, twin is a sigma. Yeah, and it's not all sigma threes. It's only the coherent sigma three. Most sigma threes are not coherent. <laughs>
Right? If I change the boundary inclination, then they're just random boundaries. They look like random boundaries, right? It's just the coherent one that's special. Well, it just is some partial dislocation. That's all. No, no, but, but, but the point I'm making is that if I take a sigma 3 and I change the inclination by you know, 17.29631 degrees, its energy will be almost the same as all the other grand boundary energies. So that sigma 3, the specialness of that sigma 3 is not just sigma 3, but sigma 3 and coherent which I would say is of, it happens frequently because it's so low energy, but statistically, uh, it should be a very low probability event. It's just very low energy, so you see it more often. So it's very special. Uh, Dave, uh, it's about your statement saying grand boundary is highly structured, but in behavior and character can be glass-like. Yes. But you see, it, uh, it's highly structured when it's low sigma. For yeah. example, because high sigma, for example, sigma 3, 2, 5, that's not so highly structured to me. Okay. Uh, and also for glass, glass also have structures. Yes. They, they have some clusters with some special uh, arrangement. Okay. Yes. So, so I was thinking, maybe uh, the grand boundary is sometimes not that highly structured, and sometimes it could not be so glass-like. So it's it's always depends what kind of grand boundary you're talking about, right? No, no, no. it really depends on what do you mean. <laughs> so, I mean, if I look if I look at a glass, okay, a glass will very often, you know. There's lots of structures you can have. And the larger the region you look, the more kinds of ways you can arrange the things in that volume. But if you look very locally, there's very, there's, there's very frequently occurring short range order. Yes. So if I look at that in very small scale, and I look at that short range order there, I would say, yeah, it looks very ordered. It doesn't look random. If I look on a large scale, it looks random. If I look at a sigma 9,327, still... if I look at any place in that boundary in a small region, it looks just like a sigma 5 or a sigma 9 or a sigma 12, 13. And it's just then at larger scale, you see an arrangement of these minority units which seem to be randomly placed. So if I look at it, a non-sigma boundary, a non-sigma boundary is just a sigma boundary with a irregular distribution of defects in it. Just like if I look at the local scale of a glass, it looks very ordered. If I, the larger the volume I look, the more disordered it looks. It's not quite, ex it's not, the analogy is not yeah, perfect. Yeah. The analogy is not perfect because in the grain boundary, I still have the periodicity of the crystals out there. So that puts additional constraints on it. So my analogy is not perfect, but the idea, I think, seems to work. Okay. Okay, David, okay, so very uh, inspirational talk. I think I really enjoy listening to this lecture because I really learned a lot. In the meantime, I'm fitting this. When I, when I go through these lectures, uh, you said reinforcing the notion that the green boundary is just like a glass, just like a glass. May not look like glass structurally, but it's a behaving term, behaving into thermodynamics, it's like glass. My, my, my question goes back to the Coleman catastrophe you showed yes. us, right? Yes. But we know that in real structural glass, to avoid this catastrophe, you have glass transitions. So the entropy will yeah. not go down to zero. And right. So you notice I didn't also go down to zero, I extrapolated yeah, to extrapolate. zero. So if Just that, like you do in glasses. Yeah. So if that's, if that's the case, when, so probably could say that when you quench down, the temperature of a liquid, metallic liquid, to form crystals. You could have all a quenched in, metastable green boundaries. Yes. Uh, that what you said, like a glass like green boundaries. They follow some kind of thermodynamics because it's quenched in, it's metastable. It's uh, you form the formation of such green boundaries which will avoid the Kozman catastrophe. Yes, that's right. 
And, you know, that whole idea, you know, I, I sort of developed by sort of looking at the uh, Stillinger quenches, which was, you know, you go to very high temperature and you quench, very high temperature, you quench fast, very high temperature, quench fast to get the distribution of states. If I actually slowly, 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 slowly cooled, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't see, the, you wouldn't see this uh, Kasman temperature. And it's just like with glasses. Many, many, many glasses, if you cool it slowly enough, yeah, you, trap to the you, you may end up in a crystalline phase. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but you may, or at least into very stable glass phases. So that's why I try to emphasize the point. There's sort of the equilibrium, which is one extreme. There's the random quench, which means very, very fast quench, is the other extreme. Most systems and most processing conditions will find something in between. The other. Um, oh, but by the way, let me before. I just don't want to get in trouble on this one point. I, I had a long talk with uh, Franz Spappen about this, and he'd bite my head off if I told you, if I try to leave you with the impression that grain boundaries are glasses. <laughs> it's glass like. I try to emphasize some of the properties have properties in common with glasses. That's not to say that they are glasses. <laughs> I mean, he spent several decades of his career proving this point, so I don't want to. Yeah, this, may I say one comment? So this is uh, the same question I ask you. When we have a lunch, I, I ask you, can we define this operation in the amorphous material? So. You know, once you're talking about the, the DSC dislocation in grain boundary, then I think the structure is not uh, the glass, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I will never say that the grain boundary has a, is structurally a glass. I can say it may have properties look like a glass because there are many metastable states. That metastability is associated with this dislocation structure. So. I just have to. I, I I really try to be careful when I say this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the last question I want to ask is about you know the green size effect. Yes. When we talk about green boundaries. Actually, green boundary won't exist without grains. Right? You, Good point. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that elasticity. We we didn't. You didn't emphasize elasticity here. Yes. Right? Elasticity I will. That's will depend yet. on green size because yes. the stress field of elasticity will be somewhat cut off by the grains. So that will bring about the green size fat into this green boundary, you know, the issues. 100%. So you will talk about that later on. Yes, we'll talk about that later on because it turns out that um, finite grain sizes and constraints of other grains on a particular grain boundary can have profound effects. So if I look at a fine grain material and a coarse grain material, the behavior can look quite different in the grain boundary because of the mechanical constraint, which is back stresses. And, right, and, and that's a very important point. So T-space here, T-space you mentioned that actually is uh, refers to an ideal condition that the grain size fat is not important. Yeah. So, right, so, so most of the cases I was talking about is I assumed that the, grain, the two grains wanted to slide this way, they could, which is to say that, imagine I'm in a bicrystal. But if I'm in a polycrystal, there's mechanical constraint, all the other grains around it, and it's very, very important, and I will come back to that. So you always give me a good sets of questions for the next lecture. So, <laughs> any other question? Um, may I ask a question? Sure. Oh, sorry. I, I I'll pass to you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I saw that you have a comparison between uh, aluminum, uh, silicon, and tungsten. Yes. Uh, for I'm I'm surprised to see that there's so many uh, possibility for the silicon. So, may I ask, is just because of their crystalline structure? different like diamond cubic and BVCC or also because of the uh, like a diffusion energy barrier? Well, so I mean we particularly chose cases where we have three different crystal structures and different kinds of bonding, yes. right? Keep in mind silicon, the bonding is very Covenant. directional. Right. 
And you talk about most of the medals, and uh, as we always teach our students, medals all look like billiard balls. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's non-directional bonding. I think really what's going on in silicon, which is why we get so many estates, is just because of the directional bonding. I think it's more the bonding than the crystal structure per se, but you know, it's the directional bonding in silicon that gives you that crystal structure. Okay, thank so. you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to hear that because now it really we consider bonding types. Yeah, yeah, bonding I think is is really what's uh, the important point for that. This is what we are currently working on. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, David. Uh, can we theoretically predict the magnetic property of the green boundary in the magnetic materials? Mm. For example, polycrystal magnetic materials. Is that possible? Well, yes and no. It depends on which magnetic properties we're talking about. So, for example, it's possible to do a DFT calculation and look to see, you know, you can find that here it should be ferromagnetic, here it should be ferromagnetic, but at the grain boundary it could be paramagnetic. But you have to, it's not easy to even specify what exactly do you mean by that. <laughs> and the reason I'm asking because it's, you know, the grain boundary is for like a two-dimensional interface and a three-dimensional body. So what would you exactly measure and so I could, I could look, for example, I could look at the moments, the magnetic moment on the atoms, depending on where they are. And so if you're measuring local magnetic moment, I, I think you could do this. <laughs> you're the only guy I know who can do this. Um, if you actually measure the local magnetic moment as, a, as you go across the boundary, you, could, you should be able to see something. But I, I'd say, so, so since we have to do DFT calculations to do that, you know, we can only look at very highly symmetric special boundaries. You know, if I try to pick a sigma 971, the unit cell would be very large. But if you want me to do a sigma 5, a sigma 3, a, you know, something relatively small unit cell, we could do that, and that might be an interesting thing to look at. And I think the DFT calculations not so bad, you know, magnetism's complicated anyway in any DFT calculations. Um, you know, you take a paramagnetic material, does that mean that the, does that mean that the magnetic moment is zero? Or does that mean that just the magnetic moment is itinerant? If it's itinerant, you still measure, you could still measure a moment if you do it on a very fast measurement. So, I'm not quite sure how to ask the question. <laughs> it's a good question, but I don't know how to ask it. So if you tell me exactly what you mean, maybe we could, maybe we could think about it. Yeah, thank you. OK. Any other questions from our students? And uh, uh, maybe uh, one last question. <laughs> maybe it's a little bit naive question. Yeah. So when we see- <laughs> There are no uh, bad we, questions, just we, bad answers. <laughs> maybe fit for the nature of this uh, tutorial. <laughs> Yes. So I see when we illustrate the grand boundary, well, we always draw a straight line. Mm. I mean, would that be any like possibility to have some curved line for the grand boundary? Well, I mean, if I mean, there, there's a question of scale, right? Okay. So if, 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 if you're looking on a micron scale, obviously you see curved boundaries, mm -hmm. right? If I'm looking on the scale of five angstrom, I can't really see a curve. And if I look somewhere in between, I can have something which is microfaceted. So if it's curved, if I look in detail, it looks like microfaceted, okay. and say, is that flat or is that curved? And the answer is yes. Mm. <laughs> Just depends on what you mean by it. Okay. So. Grain boundaries on a large scale are rarely flat unless the, en unless the energy cusp with respect to inclination is very, very deep. So where do you see this? Well, coherent twins. 
because the energy of a coherent twin is a couple, you know, small number of millijoules per square meter. Uh, no, a small, yeah, a small number of millijoules per square meter. But if I if I then change it by just a few degrees, it'll go up by a factor of 500 in just a very small angular range. So in that case, there's a huge torque to pull it back. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a very special case. Okay. Yeah, I have this question because partly I see that in the landscape, the energy distribution is they, they are not like a straight, right? In the, in the you know, plot, in the calculation of the energy minimal. Yeah, those uh, landscape map. Yes. And uh, another reason is I see that because you have a different phase of the grand boundary, so they, they may form some steps. I'm not sure like whether they still consider as one single grand boundary or, or right. two, um, if they have multiple such kind of uh, different phase. Right, so as we start to talk about faceted boundaries, then we have to get into the line defects on the boundaries. When we talk about like, the steps and the dislocation characters, that's what the fasting looks like on, on, on an atomic scale. And I'll talk about that next time. Okay, great. great. Um, <laughs> let's give Professor David Sorovitz again. Yep. So let's for look forward to the next talk. <laughs> Very nice. Next Tuesday, uh, not next Thursday, the same time. Welcome. Yeah. We <laughs> Oh, I think. Okay. Oh, eight. <laughs> <laughs>